and welcome to the Humanity Leadership Podcast. I'm David Wheatley and we're here to talk all things leadership. And with me today is Corey Fernandez, my colleague at Humanity. And uh, we just got off the back of a fascinating weekend's program and we thought it would be worth uh, dissecting it a little bit and sharing some best practices because we just delivered a two-day, 16-hour program to 106 people over Zoom and um, got what I would say is great feedback for it and a lot of surprising feedback. So we're going to talk about it. Welcome, Corey. It's good to have you. Yeah, thanks, David. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, not a problem. And it's, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into this and built a, a large team. And, and I keep hearing people, some of my clients are saying, we'd really like to have that offsite, but... You know, with COVID happening and travel restrictions, we don't want to do it. And I keep saying, well, have you thought about doing it on Zoom? And they say, yeah, yeah it's not quite as good. And I will admit that about uh, six months ago, I would have agreed with them. And in the last five months, we've got really smart at doing this. And um, this last weekend was probably the biggest event to have 106 people on Zoom for 16 hours total over two days and uh, get the result that we wanted. So... So we're going to share some best practices today. Any any opening thoughts from you about what we just did? I, I, just a reflection on the weekend. It was a lot of fun. It was high energy. Um, it was, you know, uh, it brought a lot of focus to the teams that we were working with across 106 people. So I just, for again, for anyone that is hesitant and they don't think this could be rewarding or fun or energizing for their organization, I do think it's worth reconsidering because uh, we have some proof and we're about to speak to that. Right. And um, I don't mind sharing where we were working, which is a, a large central Mich Lansing based Michigan State University that uh, and their executive MBA program, which we've worked on for 22 years now, uh, opening their a team based uh, executive MBA and getting 20 study teams up and running in a way that uh, we always say we try to get them to a place like they've known each other for 10 weeks in the 16 hours we have together. And we've done it face-to-face -face for the previous 21 years, but this time we pivoted to virtual and, uh, and I think everybody was quite pleased with how it went. So, so we just want to share some, some best practices because um, at the beginning, I'd say that of the 106 people, not many knew each other. At the end of the 16 hours, we did a little test and there were somewhere between two and three degrees of separation between everybody. So if, if you hadn't had a good conversation with, another person than somebody you knew had had a good conversation with another person, which if you think about that dynamic for 106 people was, uh, I was quite impressed with the, them pulling that off. Yeah, absolutely. They were able to really invest the time wisely, uh, not only in the familiar groups that they got the most time with, but also in the ways we helped them expand who they knew in their rooms more or less uh, throughout the entire session. And I always say this is 106 type A type people because the reason that they're mid-career and doing an MBA at uh, Michigan State is because they have ambition and drive. And so it's always fascinating when you sit them down and say the, the five people in your group are going to be responsible for about 40, 45% of your grade and have them all look at you with those kind of, what, what did you just say? So, so there's a few best practices and I'm going to start off with the, the first one, which I, I think was to establish a team. And uh, to do this on your own would have been crazy. To, we had a team of people, both you and I, uh, from a facilitation perspective, but we were backed up by the MSU executive MBA team who uh, provided a moderator uh, who took care of things like the, uh, the managing the breakout rooms and the chat box and questions that people had. And, and they were wired into the system to allow them to ask the questions for folks as well. So, and we also had uh, a lot of tech help and uh, MSU provided folks that were there to support Zoom issues and tech issues. And we had a little issue to start off with, uh, but we it got resolved and we were able to then see everybody and people were able to see us and be able to see the slide deck and uh, hear us. And it was all recorded as well, which was kind of cool. And then the moderators work shifts and, and even you and I took it in turn so that we we don't get burned out on, on Zoom and they didn't get burned out on us either. So I think one of the first things that was most important was this isn't a one person show. This was a collective that really made this run smoothly and people stepping in and out to back each other and, and making sure that things were being prepared and followed up on 
uh, at any given time. So uh, rule number one will be it's a team event. Uh, yeah, I think the underlying insight there, David, is that, you know, as, as people, as learners, uh, we like variety. Um, so it's really important for us to be able to see and hear multiple people or points of view or, or you know, hear different voices or different uh, perspectives or even screenshots, right? So all that kind of adds up into a rich learning experience. And if you just have it from one person in one angle and one screenshot for that period of time for 16 hours, it's going to get really boring for the learner. Exactly. So take us to best practice number two. Yeah, so with that, so if you think about all the ways that we try to mix and match David's facilitation, my facilitation, all the coordination with the kind of offstage team, our moderators, it took a tremendous amount of pre-work. So if you are considering how to pull this off and pull it off successfully, we absolutely are going to uh, emphasize the importance of pre-work. We had a 114-line uh, item agenda in our world that helped us really understand each key segment of the agenda the breaks, the handoffs between David to me and me to David, um, and also the way we were gonna use breakout rooms or large group rooms and so on. And all that was flushed out really well into an agenda. We went into as much detail as just trying to identify which content, whether it be a slide, whether it be our booklet, whether it be us verbally speaking uh, to the group about how to help organize their thoughts or the ways that they were working together. We made sure that was crafted in our agenda. So absolutely you want to have a lot of pre-planning and pre-work that goes into that just to make sure you're real clear on how you're going to guide that many people through from the very beginning all the way to the very end. Um, the other piece that we continue to find with Zoom is when, when we say pre-work, um, especially when you're trying to create an environment with a lot of interaction and small group breakouts and larger group experiences, uh, the breakout rooms do require a little coordination for thinking about who you want in which rooms in advance. Um, and you want to make sure you have accurate contact information because Zoom does allow you to pre-assign people into rooms, but it's dependent on them coming in with the correct contact information because you're going to be doing this work well before they get live into the session. And you, if they sign in with inaccurate contact information or different contact information, it can screw up some of the ways that you've made those assignments. So if you're organizing you know, specific functional teams to be a part of an experience together or a dialogue together, or if you're organizing cross-functional folks that you want to talk more and get to know each other better and invest some time together, you just wanna make sure you have the right thinking as to who's in what room and who has what contact information because it does make those pre-assignments a lot more clear. Right. And the last piece I'd add, David, on the pre-work is just trying to insert some, some social component. So over 16 hours of time, if you're just kind of blazing through a hard charging uh, work agenda and there isn't a chance for people to enjoy the rich social uh, relation, relationships that we all crave right now, especially in an area or an era of a pretty big isolation, um, you know, you're missing an opportunity. And so we definitely would recommend pre-planning some way to bring a social gathering together uh, within that setting. So and we did some of that on the, the evening of the first day, an exercise we call Quick Connect, which everybody then quickly took called speed dating, yeah. which uh, was very similar to the structure of the discipline of speed dating. And then we even would normally go to a, like a bar evening. And we even simulated that in order to create some social interaction and just every 20 minutes would change the, the groups. I think that the other thing in terms of the discipline that I thought was a, a nice pickup was uh, we gave people permission to change the names on the Zoom screen and asked them to add the, the study team number to the end so that it made it easy for the folks distributing into groups to mix and match in their appropriate way. Uh, because if it said 11, everybody went to team 11. Uh, it was it made it simple. Uh, and one of the rules I have on Zoom is I'm going to call you wherever it says in the bottom left-hand corner and you have permission to change that. So change it to what you want to be called. And, and we were able to add some discipline, some structure in there. Yep, absolutely. So the, the third thing that, that I found was, um, you know, as a facilitator, having multiple screens has been a godsend. I've got multiple screens here at, at my home office and we had multiple going on at uh, the Henry Center in Lansing. And, and the ability to be able to see as many people as possible on one screen, even though you were showing a slide as well, meant that you could see a lot of the interaction. You could see when people smiled, when they laughed, when they were responding to what was being said. And so again, you're emulating 
being in a real life situation. You're not hearing the giggles or the sniggers or the comments, but you're seeing people say stuff and it was easy to pick up on folks. Uh, now, because it was 106 people, you only got something like, uh, I think it's 40 on a screen at any given time. And so there were multiple pages and some of our help, the rest of the team could scroll through and just make sure that folks were on video and were engaged and, uh, and seeing if anybody put their hand up, et cetera. Yeah. There is something to be said about having as many screens on as, as possible. I, there were multiple times, David, where I remember you were commenting and, and you know, just referencing somebody grabbing a sip of coffee or a, a cup of tea and, or noticing the background that they had and seeing that there was a, uh, you know, a, um, yeah, a reference to their hometown that you're able to quickly relate to them on, right? And that just shows that the facilitator's paying attention and that you are kind of locked into a live session, whether it's in person or through video and having that connection with the facilitator and other peers um, is really valuable. Yeah, it's always fun to spot dogs and cats. And uh, yeah. I think on Saturday, I was looking at somebody's background and out of the window to see what the weather was like because it turned out they lived just a few miles from my house. Yeah. So it was, we were having a conversation about that. So yeah. take us to, um, take us to the next best practice, our, our fourth best practice. Yeah, so number four, I think we wanted just to share the importance of having just various forms of instruction. So it's more specifically three forms of instruction. So if you think about all of us as learners, we do have different preferences for how we digest or absorb information. And so, you know, we actually had, um, you know, a, a cadence for how we move people into breakout rooms and then into a large group and then back into breakout rooms and then back to the large group. And so we had to be very specific about the timing, the roles of each of those smaller groups and the deliverables, what they actually needed to come out of that breakout session with. And we had to be very specific. So we would often do it verbally from a facilitation standpoint from the front of the room, so to speak, or the front of the screen. And then we'd also make sure that it was written um, in a bulleted list on a slide. And then it also had a booklet. So the, each participant had a booklet, a physical booklet in their hands and certain pages referenced similar instructions. So we could just tell them to go to page 29 and that would guide the small group appropriately. Um, and it was just really important for them to be able to digest that information in various ways. And every time we'd move people into a breakout room, we invited uh, each participant to take a screenshot of the slide with the instruction as well, so that when they are in their breakout room, they could reference their mobile phone, the picture, and they wouldn't lose a step on what they were being asked to do. Right, and we'd mailed those booklets to them beforehand, so everybody had the same materials in front of them when we got started. So, so and then, um, you know, best practice number five, as we were talking about this, uh, is an interesting one because it's really remember that the panic and the craziness that was going on at the Henry Center, where I was with the, the Ember team, is nothing like what people are seeing when they're at the other end. And, and you, you'd zoomed in, I was actually there with the, the team. And uh, there was a couple of instances where things really weren't working from a logistics perspective at our end. And yet, when you went into the breakout groups afterwards, they'd hardly noticed that things weren't working. Now, they were also quite forgiving, I think, of the logistics of managing 106 people, but uh, the craziness at our end wasn't actually seen at the other end, uh, partially because we were able to quickly adapt and, and pivot, and the team really dived in and did what was necessary, um, but, but partly because it's, you know, it's like anything else. The, the, the duck may be paddling hard under the water, but looks very graceful on the surface, right. and that, that seems to be how it came across. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you couldn't tell it was seamless and all the back end work that was happening live on your end, David, when you're actually on site, you couldn't tell it all. So and that kind of links us to the sixth one of our best practices. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, this is where if you have a, a great team kind of behind the scenes, an offstage team um, that's able to coordinate very well on some of those transitions and so on, it does give a lot of flexibility for the facilitators to dive into breakout rooms. And so our sixth tip for everyone here is, is to really think about your role as a facilitator. If that is the role you're gonna be playing is to use those breakout rooms, not just for a chance to take a break and you know, refresh yourself, um, really use that as an opportunity to move in and out of the breakout rooms and connect real time with the conversations and the progress they're making on deliverables. If you're asking them to come out of the end of this with a real work product or a decision, or an insight 
you know, it's really valuable for, for people like David and I and all of you who would be doing this to rotate in and out and try to touch as many of those breakout rooms as possible. Um, because it also adds some credibility when you come back as a large group and as facilitators, you've already clued in on some of the conversations that they're having and you're able to insert some of that and highlight and applaud and celebrate various teams and groups for their efforts um, and make sure you're sharing those kind of small group learnings with the larger group. Um, and we really do that, uh, you know, nonstop consistently with all the teams we work with, with all the groups that we work with. And it's just really a valuable tool um, where it's a lot easier to take a pause and take a break. But, you know, dipping in and out of those breakout rooms is something we certainly recommend. Yeah, and if you're assigned as a co-host, then once the moderator, in this case, who was our main host, sends you, assigns you to a breakout room, you can then move around the breakout rooms at, at, at will, uh, dipping in and out. Um, if you're if you're not a co-host, then once you're assigned, it's hard to you have to go back to the central place. But we were able to move around from breakout room to breakout room, and even beforehand share. You do one through ten, I'll do eleven through twenty, and and we work through them. So pretty much at each breakout, they got to see one of us at some point, just to see that we were checking up on them and and there to help with any clarity. Yeah. So. Yeah. So then if I just summarize our uh, six, you, we talked about, you know, realize that this is a team game and that trying to do it on your own would probably drive you crazy with this number, but don't worry about bringing in a team of people to help you take in different roles. The, the pre-work pays off massively. Invest in the planning and putting structure and systems and, and thought behind what you're going to do and, and making sure that simple things like the logistics of email addresses are the right ones to come in. As, as many screens as possible allows you to see as much as possible and get that interaction and make sure that you're looking people in the eye when you can. Uh, multiple forms of instruction. If you're wanting people to give, uh, to do something, which is what we always drive for, it should be a solid work product, something that is meaningful to folks. But let's make sure we're making it clear in multiple forms so that it resonates with everybody. Yep. Remember, things don't look as bad to them as they might do to you as you're planning it. If you're panicking, don't worry about it too much. Uh, they're probably just taking a second to check their email and coming back to you when you're ready. And then make sure as a facilitator that you don't disengage, but you dip in and out when people are in breakout rooms just to build credibility and understand. And it also allows you to ask better questions when you come back to the to the large group. Sure does. Uh, but thanks for uh, for playing with me this last weekend and, and doing the work that we did with the executive MBA. And thanks for sharing the best practices. And uh, I hope that some people can take some of these and go away and say okay we're ready for that that off-site or that group meeting and we're ready to do it now and if, if folks want any help don't hesitate to reach out Corey Great. thanks for joining me you've mm -hmm. been listening to the Humanity Leadership Podcast I'm David Wheatley and at Humanity we believe that the world needs a new kind of leader and we believe it's you so thanks to Brian Spencer for the music at the beginning and uh, share your feedback go to iTunes and give us a review that helps people find us in the interim, we'll see you next time. Otherwise, stay healthy. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, David.